This is the day our Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to take this moment to welcome you to this season of worship. I'm glad that you're viewing through the website and through our Facebook page. And we certainly ask God's blessings to be upon each and every one of you as we seek to worship God in spirit and in truth. Just a few things quickly by way of announcement. Please continue your faithfulness with your tithes and offerings. We greatly appreciate your ongoing support for the mission of Little Rock Church. It's very important that we continue that faithfulness for the sake of our denominational support and also the upkeep of our church and our local ministry. So thank you for what you have done, and please continue to keep up that good work as we're going through this time of virtual services. We also have our online Bible study time. We're now through chapter 3 of Nehemiah. You can find all of those videos by visiting our Facebook group or either the church website. If you go to the church website, you will also find all of the handouts for the Nehemiah study. That includes the background and actually four chapters. I've actually uploaded just today the fourth chapter of notes so that you can go ahead and preview those as we get ready to look at chapter four in the week to come. Please keep in mind if you would like a copy of your church contributions for 2021 for tax purposes, let Terry Ford know as soon as possible. And if you would like to be a sponsor for lawn maintenance, housekeeping, or supply flowers during worship this year, fill out one of the notebooks which is currently located in the conference room. Speaking of flowers for worship, over to my left, your right in the video, you'll notice some beautiful flowers that have been supplied today by the family of Linda Davis, and they've been given to the glory of God and in loving memory of her birthday. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we worship God together. together online, you'll find a copy of our worship order for today located on the church website. Would you join me in the responsive call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 42? As the deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food both day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Will you join me in our invocation by praying the prayer that our Lord taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Hear the word of our Lord as found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can be my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. As we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer today, we're mindful of so many within our church family and this community who were sick, who have been hurting, who were going through times of recovery. Certainly you all had needs that are close to your hearts and minds. Are there others that you all would like to include on our prayer list? Even when we do not have the words to pray, God understands our hearts. God sees each and every one of us, and he knows our needs are very important. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? Oh Lord, you have invited us into this journey of discipleship. It's a journey like nothing else. It's one filled with trials and tribulations, highs and lows, twists and turns. It's a journey that calls for commitment and discipline. Lord, it takes everything that we have to be faithful, to make it through each and every day. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard. It's downright tough. There are days when things are already overwhelming and then one more thing comes up. But we are reminded that you are with us through this journey. We do not enter this path of discipleship alone because we know there are countless individuals who have already charted a course before us. We follow in their legacy. Lord, help us to learn from their example. May each and every day we test our commitment and our desire to follow you wherever you would lead us. Lord, as we worship today, we say thank you for life's gifts for your power and your presence, which is wonderfully known each and every day in countless ways. We thank you for peace, hope, and comfort to give us the strength and the stamina we need to continue pressing forward as we live out our lives of faith and we seek to be an example to the world around us. Lord, today we come with many hearts that are heavy, many needs that are pressing upon our minds. Lord, the scriptures remind us that you know what we have need of even before we call upon you in prayer. But what a wonderful privilege we have, an opportunity to come before you just as a child to a parent. 
and know that you see us and feel us and understand us and that you will not leave us alone for the living of these times. We entrust to you the names of all of those on our prayer list, all of those situations that are unspoken, all of those individuals who've been battling COVID-19, those who have cancers and heart conditions and kidney problems, those who have fallen, those who are going through times of rehabilitation. The needs of our hearts are very many, but you are a God who is big enough to see and understand all of our circumstances. Give us confidence, Lord, when we pray, because the word reminds us that all things are possible for those who believe. Now, Lord, that doesn't mean we're going to get everything we wish for in life. But it does mean that you will be close at hand to sustain us through whatever may come our way in this journey of faith. Now, Lord, continue to be with us in this season of worship. And when we depart this time together, may we be eager to go forth and serve as your hands and feet in the journey ahead. This prayer we lift up in your Son's most precious and holy name.
invite you to join together as we affirm our Christian faith and think about what it means to belong to this community of faith. Would you join me? Together we are the people of God. From the beginning, we have been created to do the good work of making God known within this world. It is not a task into which we enter lightly. It comes at great cost and with tremendous challenges along the way. We do not go at it alone. We have sisters and brothers in the faith who help shoulder our burdens and encourage us to stay the course each day. The service which we render continues the example of countless individuals who have gone before us. This great cloud of witnesses cheers us forward and reminds us that our efforts are indeed worth the sacrifice. As we live out this tremendous calling, we lean into God's strength, hope, and courage for the work that is still to be done. Amen. Our sermon text for today, as we continue in this series from the book of Nehemiah, is taken from chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 11 through 18. May we give ear to the reading of Holy Scripture. So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I got up during the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal that I took was the animal that I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate, past the dragon spring, and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the animal I was riding to continue. So I went up by way of the valley by night and inspected the wall. Then I returned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest that were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. May God add a blessing of this reading to our understanding and also to the daily living of our faith. Amen. To begin 2022, we've been looking at the story of Nehemiah. It's a beautiful story. It's a complex story with so many different variables, twists and turns. It's a story of renewal and recommitment. It's a time for God's people to remember that in spite of the past and all of its difficulties, God was not finished. The same can be said for our world today. Even though we live in some troubling and trying times, God continues to have a purpose for the church to fulfill. Now that purpose may be very different from that of Nehemiah and the people hundreds of years before Christ, but it continues to be a ministry, a goal, a pursuit that we have before us. We have been given this opportunity to live for such a time as this in order that we might continue to make a difference for the sake of God's kingdom. 
When we look at these words, we find that Nehemiah has not only received imperial permission from King Artaxerxes of Persia to go back to visit Judah, he's also received letters of commendation. He's received resources that will be necessary for the reconstruction efforts there in the city of Jerusalem. When we look at the passage that has just been read, it informs us of some of the initial planning that Nehemiah engaged in to prepare the people for that process. He goes out under the cover of night. He does not give any information, any insight as to why, but he wants to see for himself just how bad the conditions are, how dire the situation is within the remnants of the city of Jerusalem. He goes out, he takes time traveling counterclockwise around the remainder of the city, investigating, looking closely at the broken down walls, the piles of stone, the gates that would have been burned by fire during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. It's not a pretty sight. It's a time to realize just what is, but yet what also needs to be done. I believe that Nehemiah knew that this would be a challenge. It would be an uphill battle, but just how difficult would that be? Until he got there and saw for himself, he couldn't fully understand or appreciate just exactly what his brother and the other men from Judah had reported to him. But during that midnight ride, he found out that conditions were going to be tough. But at the same time, he gained an idea of what was going to be needed not only for himself as a leader coming and challenging God's people to the reconstruction process. It was also in an effort to let the people know what would be possible, what would be doable through the strength and the resources supplied by God. It may have seemed like an impossibility to some people, but here at this point in Nehemiah's story, it reminds us that even the uphill battles in life, the trials, the tribulations, the struggles, do not have the final word. They do not get the final say because God is still in the work of renewing and rebuilding when His people remain faithful to the calls before us. We might call this level of faithfulness commitment. I've read recently of that word commitment. It was described by NBA coach Pat Riley one time as being... You either are or you aren't. There is no in-between in life. That's such a simple but yet powerful description of what it means to be committed. You're either in or you're out. You're yes or you're no. There's no riding the fence. I'm reminded of a story of Luciano Pavarotti, the great tenor from the realm of opera singing. Once he shared a story from his childhood, how he was taught by his father to appreciate the art of singing. And as he grew older, he worked as hard as he could to refine his voice. He became a student of one of the local singing professionals there in his hometown within Italy. But at the same time that he was learning more how to sing and how to refine and perfect the usage of his tenor voice, he also enrolled in teaching school. Upon graduating from that teaching school, he approached his father and said, Father, What should I do? I'm torn between two alternatives. I love singing, but I've also pursued the path of teaching. Pavarotti said that his father looked at him and said, Luciano, you can't sit 
in two chairs at the same time. If you sit between two chairs, you're going to fall through. You have to select one chair and stick with it. It struck Pavarotti at that point in his journey that it was true not only of his own life experience, but also of that for so many people within the world, whether they be teachers or bricklayers or ministers or whatever the calling may be. You have to choose just one chair. You have to be committed. Either you are or you aren't. There is no in-between. That's something that's a great challenge within the community of faith today, this word commitment. It seems like maybe two or three generations ago, believers were through the roof with their commitment to the local church. Any and every time the doors were open, people would fill the pews. Sunday morning, Sunday school and worship, Sunday night worship, midweek services, revivals that could go on for weeks and weeks at a time. People would come. It was the place to be. It was the thing to do. It seemed like the right thing in life. At one time, our culture was all about the church. But now we've fallen on difficult times. We look at our world. And as I've already suggested in my previous sermons from Nehemiah, we may not be in Babylonian captivity, but we can feel at times in this journey as though we are in exile. Because we look at the pews on Sunday mornings. We look at the numbers on the live stream that we're able to have through the internet each and every week. And sometimes it's encouraging, but to be quite honest, sometimes it's discouraging for all pastors. We wonder, where are the people? Where is the loyalty, the devotion? Church seems to be important, but only in special circumstances. Only at certain times when it's maybe convenient for those individuals. So to look at commitment today we might say it is a struggle. It's a struggle in a lot of facets of public life, but especially within the life of the faith community. Because church has become just one more thing among many things to do. It's another option, another choice among many each and every week that people have to say yay or nay to. Why is it that we struggle with commitment, especially when it comes to faith? What would it mean if we could rethink our commitment and rediscover our passion to be the local church? Whether that be live and in person within this sanctuary or in a classroom on Sunday or Wednesday or even as we become creative and think about ways to carry church out to the world. What if we rediscovered our commitment? How could the church continue to change our world even though it may be a trying time? One of the first things that we can notice from this passage within Nehemiah is that in order to commit to anything, we have to have a sense of purpose. We must know our purpose. We must know, identify why it is that we exist. Why is it that we do this thing called church? Does God need the church? Does God want the church? What does it mean to say yes, that we're a part of a community of faith, to be a member of Little Rock Original Free Will Baptist, or whatever congregation you may be affiliated with? What does it mean for you to say, I am a Christian, but not a Christian in isolation, a Christian that is a part of something bigger than I am individually? What does it mean to say that I am the church? I go to church. I want to be the church. 
That's all a part of our purpose. Rediscovering who we have been created to be by God as a faith community. It's been attributed to Mark Twain as well as to other speakers. But I've heard it said before that there are two important days within your life. First, the day that you were born. And secondly, the day that you discover why. That's important not only to our individual lives, but it's important in the community of faith to remember why it is that we are here. Why God long ago formed this group of people, this group that began as a small core of disciples, a group of Christ supporters that met in the upper room, believers who were assembled on what we've come to know as the day of Pentecost, and for the better part of 2,000 years has continued to proclaim this message about Jesus Christ. What does it mean for us to be God's people? Many times when we read our affirmation of faith during our time of worship, we say that we believe the church is the body of Christ, all believers everywhere. It means that we are a people who have something in common, and that commonality is our salvation through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But we also believe that it's in the context of the local church that we do this thing called faith, that we practice our Christianity. Now, yes, we can do that on our own. It's important that we have our individual witness, but it's also important that when we say we're a part of the church, that we agree to support the ongoing ministry of the church. Is the church perfect? No. Are we perfect? Certainly not. Is the world ideal? Most definitely not. But it is the context in which we've been called to do ministry. And as the church, we have a purpose to make God known within the world. Author Rick Warren has said, Without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Author Oswald Chambers says something quite similar. We tend to set up success in Christian work as our purpose. But our purpose should be to display the glory of God in human life, to live a life hidden with Christ in God in our everyday human conditions. We as the people of God do not exist just as a social club. We're different than being members of the local gym or whatever other calls might be around us. We belong to something in order that we might make God known. And before we can fully commit to that as Christians, we have to remember that is our purpose. So many times the church is scattered when it comes to ministry. A lot of times, if we're honest, we miss the forest for the trees. We're so zoned in on individual facets of doing church together that we forget the big picture as to why God has designed us, why God has kept us around for 2,000 years, and why God still wants to use us even as we live in uncertain times. Many years ago, Norman Cousins wrote an editorial in his Sunday or Saturday review. And it was based on a conversation that Cousins had had during a trip to India. It was there in India that Cousins met a Hindu priest and was able to engage in conversation. When he talked to this particular individual, 
The man said he wanted to come to our country, referring to America, to work as a missionary among the Americans. Cousins assumed that he meant that he wanted to convert Americans to the Hindu religion. But when asked, the man said, Oh no, I would like to convert them to the Christian religion. Christianity cannot survive in the abstract. It needs not membership, but believers. The people of your country may claim they believe in Christianity, but from what I read at this distance, Christianity is more a custom than anything. I would ask either that you accept the teachings of Jesus in your everyday life and in your affairs as a nation, or stop invoking His name as sanction for everything that you do. I want to help save Christianity for the Christians. It's a powerful assessment of a man from another culture an entirely different religion as to what he has come to see of Christianity specifically here in America. I believe that we've lost sight of our main goal, and any time we lose sight of the main goal, the primary purpose for which God has created us, we will aim at any and everything, and we will hit absolutely nothing. In order to be committed, we have to know what it is to exist. We must know our purpose. A second thing we can learn from Nehemiah in this text is the fact that our commitment calls for much more than emotional hype. When you read the words of Nehemiah, It says that after he had surveyed the damages around Jerusalem, he finally went to the people and invited them into the process. And within the passage it says, they said, let's do this. Let's make this happen. Let's begin to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, in many Bibles, it has that very phrase with an exclamation point at the end, indicating that it was probably said with great zest and passion and enthusiasm and energy. But you see, in life, life is so much more than just the hype. It's more than getting excited over an idea. It's about doing something with this life that God has given us and the opportunities that God has supplied us with as God's people. It's easy for us to hear someone talk about something that needs to be done in the world to make this world a different place, a better place. We can grin, we can pump our fists, that sounds really good, but... What about the follow-through? It's not enough to like something. It's not enough to express energy over something. We have to be willing to get involved and to move, to act, to make a difference. I'm reminded of the words of the great NBA player Michael Jordan. Once he said, some people want it to happen... Some people wish it would happen. Others make it happen. Making something happen means that you're not simply a person of ideas and concepts or excited about what someone else is willing to do. No, you're willing to say, I am going to be a part of this process. I'm going to be committed. I think back to my childhood, and one of my favorite afternoon programs to watch after school was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And I remember a certain episode from back in the early 80s, and I went back and rewatched it this week. There was a day that Mr. Rogers brought in a toy backhoe just like this one, and he brought in a box that was filled with tiny pebbles. 
And he used this toy backhoe to push the box of pebbles around. He took the backhoe portion and began to dig and move the pebbles from one place to another. And this wasn't the only time that Mr. Rogers was known for doing this. There were other times when he would show how things were manufactured. He would bring things in and build them for kids to see how all of it came together. And every time he did that, he would always break into a song that simply said, you've got to do it. The main verse says, you can make believe it happens or pretend that something's true. You can wish or hope or contemplate a thing that you'd like to do. But until you start to do it, you will never see it through. Because the make-believe pretending just won't do it for you. What are the ideas that God has sown within our hearts and our minds? What are the things that gain our attention when it comes to the work of God's kingdom? I think Fred Rogers was right long ago, and it's still true of the church today. We can't simply have ideas and concepts and plans on paper. We have to be a people who are willing to make them a reality. That brings me to a third and final point. Through all of this, our attitude goes a long way in the execution of our purpose. We can have a purpose. We can know why we exist as God's people. We may be willing to roll up our sleeves and get to work. But a huge part of the success of God's kingdom work each and every day happens right here. It's in our attitude. Sir Winston Churchill said long ago, the attitude is such a tiny thing, such a small thing, but oh, it makes a world of difference. I've heard it described that an attitude is a lot like a flat tire, especially if it's a bad attitude. Until you change it, you're not going anywhere. The attitude and the kind of commitment that went together for God's people in the rebuilding was a positive one. And by that, I'm not simply talking about think it and you'll receive it, think it and it's going to happen. I don't mean that prosperity kind of gospel. I mean having the right attitude goes a long way in the forward progression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we have a sourpuss attitude each and every day, we're not going to do anything. If I see a Christian who is down and out and sour, why am I going to want to commit to being a part of that faith community. Attitude makes a difference. Attitude changes things in our lives, and we have to work on that attitude even within the body of Christ. Attitudes determine our actions for good or for bad, D.L. Moody once said. But there's something else that I found interesting this week in thinking about attitudes, and it's a quote from the great NFL coach Vince Lombardi. We're just weeks away from the Super Bowl, and on that night, the winning team will be given the Vince Lombardi trophy. But once Lombardi said, it's easy to have faith in yourself and have discipline when you're a winner. When you're number one, what you've got to have is faith and discipline when you're not a winner. It's kind of a puzzling statement, isn't it? Because we live in a world that celebrates the victor. And to the victor comes all of the spoils, we hear it said. But here Lombardi's reminding us that success in football wasn't just on the good days. 
when you were playing well and having a good attitude because you knew you were the top team. It was also maintaining that positive attitude and commitment even when your team was struggling. I believe that can be said for our world today. Is church attendance down? Yes. Is church a priority for a lot of people? Not really. Is the world where we want it to be? Certainly not. But God has called us, even in these times, to keep an attitude that is focused where it needs to be, that has faith, and trust and confidence in God when life feels down and out just as we do when life feels victorious. I close with a simple illustration. For the better part of the past two years, you've seen these around. They've been in doctor's offices, barber shops, stores. It's a thermometer a touch-free thermometer. It says that it's infrared, it's battery-powered. I wonder if we were to test our commitment today, but not we test ourselves. How about if we gave something like this to Jesus? And wherever you're gathered to worship today or when we're able to be back in person, we allow Jesus to stand in the narthex and hold this up to each and every person as they come in to worship. I wonder what Jesus would find. Would he find commitment that is hot? that is willing to serve, that wants to see a good work happen in the world? Or would he find us somewhere cold? Or maybe trying to play both roles. We want to be hot, but at the same time we're cold. And of course we know in the words of the book of Revelation that the resurrected Christ would prefer that we be either one or the other, but not lukewarm. What does our commitment say about our Christianity? And what does our commitment say about our involvement within church whether that's online whether that's in person how committed are we are we a people who fully understand our purpose are we a people who live our faith even when it's not all hype and what about our attitude how does that shape who we are and who we are becoming each and every day. Thanks be unto God. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are watching this service, God is with you. I would love to say this altar is open and that you could come for prayer here in person, but soon enough we'll be back and able to do just that. Regardless of where you are, God is present to hear you as you pray. If you've never accepted Christ and made Him Lord and Savior of your life, you can do so today by confessing that you're a sinner, that you need God's free gift of grace, that you believe in what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary, and that you want to receive that into your life. Maybe you need to recommit your life to rediscover your purpose as a, as a member of the body of Christ. Maybe you need to find your passion once again. Maybe your attitude, like mine at times, needs a revamping. Perhaps there are burdens that are close to your heart. No matter your need, no matter your struggle, God is ready and willing to listen. Would you bow with me for our benediction and the blessing of our offering? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship. Lord, you've called us to complete loyalty to you each and every day. Not 80-20 or 50-50, but 100% all the time. 
Lord, enable us as this local church to rediscover our vision of you, to re-understand our purpose in being a part of the body of Christ, and give us the kind of attitude we need to live out the faith, to not simply talk a good game, but to truly be able to get out there and practice our Christianity with passion day in and day out. Lord, be with my brothers and sisters. Hear the prayers of their hearts, whatever their needs may be. Give them strength, give them comfort, give them courage for the living of these days. Heavenly Father, we also ask that you would bless our tithes and offerings and use them for the ongoing ministry of your kingdom here upon earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in the peace of Jesus Christ.